Hello, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in for our May webinar during HD Awareness Month. I'm Dr. Sarah Hernandez, the Director of Research Programs at the Hereditary Disease Foundation. I want to start by thanking our sponsor for this webinar, Neurocrim Biosciences, and everyone who has donated to the HDF to support research. Uh, and thank all of you for tuning in. So thank you so much for being here. I'm excited about today's webinar because it brings together laboratory research and HD symptoms that people experience. It's nice that we get to talk about direct applications of research on something that affects people with HD during HD Awareness Month. I'm also excited about today's webinar because it talks about a topic that everyone has experienced trouble with at some point, sleep. I have a six month old baby at home. So sleep and sleep cycles are something that I think about several times a day at this point. We're joined today by Professor Jenny Morton, who's a professor of neurobiology at the University of Cambridge. She's been working on HD since 1991 and is particularly interested in sleep, circadian rhythms, and cognitive decline in HD. For the past 10 years, she's been working with HD sheep. She believes that although it is an uncommon model, there's much to be gained from understanding the behavioral pathology of this model for HD. Her lab's goal is to identify quantifiable measures of behavior that can be used to test novel therapies for HD. We're also joined by Dr. Diana Roses, who is a clinician and researcher at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. She's the director of the Center for Neuroimaging and Aging and Neurodegenerative Diseases and the director for the Huntington's Disease Society of America Center of Excellence at Mass General Harvard Medical School. She leads a clinical translational program and is involved in observational research studies and in clinical trials. Her research focuses primarily on the development of biomarkers for use in the study of neurodegenerative diseases in the hopes of developing new treatments for both treating symptoms and for delaying onset of HD. Thank you both so much for being with us today to share your work. Before we start, I wanna remind our audience that they can ask questions in the Q&A box or at the talk. We're going to have both HD families as well as researchers on the call. So your questions can be technical or non-technical. We'll have about 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A session with our speakers. So type your questions into the Q&A box as you think of them so you don't forget. And we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, thanks again to all of you for tuning in and I will start by passing it over to Jenny. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to talk about my favorite subject, which is um, sleep. And so I'm just going to share my screen. So um, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you really about sleep itself, what it is. Why, I'm going to also talk to you about circadian rhythms and why that's important. Then I'll talk about how poor sleep affects brain function, which of course is what we all care about. And then I want to show you some data from the HD mouse models and from the HD sheep models. And then I'm going to hand over to, to, to talk to Diana so Diana can talk about how this will affect um, sleep in people with Huntington's disease and actually what you can do to improve your sleep. So Sarah, listen up. So let's talk about circadian rhythms first. And the reason I want to talk to you about circadian rhythms is because sleep is actually a circadian behavior. So circadian rhythms, we, we all know what or think we know what they are, and they're actually rhythms that cycle once a day. And just about all of our bodily functions have circadian components to them. For example, hormones like melatonin cycle. Now, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I, I'll just assume you can't. So if you take a look at the panel in the top right-hand corner, it's got day, night, and it's got a period of sleep. So we're familiar with this kind of cycle. Now, melatonin is a hormone that is switched off during the day and at about sunset, it starts to increase in levels and then it peaks in the middle of the night and then it starts to fall again. So this, you can see that this is a cycle. Core body temperature is also controlled by the circadian cycle. And it, although it's actually in the opposite direction. So you can see in the afternoon, the core, your core temperature goes up a bit and then it falls and it's at its lowest in the middle of the night when you're asleep. And this is quite, quite important because um, core body temperature and melatonin and sleep are all related to each other. But there are hundreds of circadian rhythms that are all controlled separately 
controlled at one level by a molecular clock inside each of our cells, but they're coordinated by the, a little nucleus in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So it's like the, the uh, conductor of the orchestra. So no matter which way around your sleep rhythms, when they peak, the SCN coordinates all of these behavior. And if you look at the trace in the bottom, I've just drawn some synchronized timing. It doesn't matter if they're positive or negative, the, the cl your clock coordinates to give you the optimal output if it's working properly. So point number one, sleep is actually a circadian controlled behavior. But sleep itself is actually like five orchestras all rolled into one and sleep, the control of sleep is really important. Now sleep is actually an essential as you, all of you will know. And I just put this picture in because you know, everybody has the experience where you, you desperately want to be a grown up kitty, but sometimes you're overwhelmed by the need to sleep. And this need is a physiological need and it's, it's, it just expresses how important sleep is. So we sleep for multiple reasons. We sleep to keep, to rest our body, to rest our heart, to coordinate our circadian rhythms and at one level to rest our brain. During sleep, we also clear brain metabolites. And as I said already, we regulate hormones, meta metabolism is low, blood pressure is low, so your body's resting. But your brain isn't resting during sleep. In fact, sleep is a really active process. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but the important thing that the brain does during sleep is it sorts stuff out. So while your body is resting, your brain is consolidating memories. It's sorting out the memories from what's happened in the day. It's processing emotions. And it's also getting you ready to wake up. Now, I'm not going to talk about the mechanisms that control all of these things, because in fact, different parts of the brain control you going to sleep, staying asleep, waking up, and what you um, do while you're asleep in terms of switching your brain. But just be assured that sleep is actually an active process that is critical to your well-being. Okay, so what does good sleep look like? Now, I took this picture out of a book by Matthew Walker, who's um, a sleep expert, and this shows a normal sleep cycle, and it's a, a classic sleep cycle. So you've got wake, REM sleep, which is a rapid eye movement sleep, and then you've got three stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep, which we know as non-REM. And everybody cycles through these different stages of sleep. So you go from wake down to stage three sleep, which is your slow wave and your deep sleep. And then after about 90 minutes, you come out of that phase. And there are actually two important components of sleep that we, that we measure often. The first is, non-REM sleep, how much non-REM sleep you're getting. Now you absolutely need your deep non-REM sleep, but you also need your rapid eye movement sleep for, for different purposes. And so you can see from this diagram that at the beginning of the night, you have a lot of non-REM sleep. And at the end of the night, you have a lot of REM sleep. So the best um, sleep is seven to eight hours a night, and you have these multiple stages, usually about five cycles of 90 minutes. So what happens if you don't get it? Well, we know, Sarah's just mentioned what it's like not having um, a good night's sleep. And there are many things that are attributed to poor sleep, drowsiness, difficult, difficulty concentrating, impaired driving. In fact, sleep deprivation can give you um, and a driving impairment that's actually as great as being over the limit for alcohol. And it also impairs your learning a little bit. A lot of these are small changes, impaired judgment, making slightly risky choices. Your motor skills may not be quite as good as they normally are, and you might be forgetful. Um, if it continues, you might, um, it, it might exacerbate cognitive decline. But in the end, most of these, you know, we all deal with this. And these are small changes that a normal person can get over very quickly. Now, what causes um, um, sleep deprivation? Well, not getting enough sleep, 
or getting fragmented sleep are the two main issues. And these can be caused by multiple things. Lifestyle choices. You can choose not to go to bed very early and actually not get enough sleep. Drugs and alcohol impair um, sleep or disease or disorder. Classic diseases that cause um, sleep disruption, sleep apnea, Parkinson's disease. And I put Huntington's on there because I think we ought to consider sleep disorder as part of Huntington's. Okay, so what happens if you go late to bed? Well, not much. We've all been to bed a couple of hours later than we should have. And what I've done here is I've just shifted this life cycle and you can see that it's dropped off the last cycle of the day. So you don't get that last bit of REM sleep. Doesn't matter much, you know, we can, we can manage without that bit of REM sleep. Ditto, if you go to bed at a reasonable time, but you wake up early, again, you lose those last couple of um, cycles of, of sleep. This may be because you work shifts and you go to bed, but you have to get up and go to work. Depression causes early awakening, as does alcohol. So alcohol is one of the lifestyle drugs that we take that actually doesn't give you as good quality sleep. And the other, my favorite bugbear is nighttime light. Now these are two people looking at their phones and you think, I don't look at my phone very much, but I want to show you an experiment that's been done um, actually in blind people to show you how important light is or not having light in your um, night. Now these are six examples of it from an experiment done in blind people to look at the effect of light on melatonin secretion. Now these people couldn't see light, but the endogenous clock is still coordinated through light in the retina. Now, if you look at the dark black lines, you can see this is melatonin concentrations in a person without, um, without light. So pretty typical, and there's quite a lot of variation between these people. Now look at what happens when they leave the lights on. Now this was a deliberate experiment. These people can't see light, but their retinas can see light. And you can see that the light has suppressed melatonin. And if you aren't blind, this is a, an exaggerated effect. So having light on at night suppresses your melatonin. And there's now very good evidence that long-term disruption in your sleep is associated with multiple disorders in people who don't have other diseases. So long-term sleep disruption in normal people is associated with heart disease, cancer, an increased um, likelihood of dementia, diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. So everybody should pay attention to their sleep, whether or not you have um, a, a neurological disorder. Now, I want to show you some evidence. I'm only going to show you two experiments, which is why I think that in Huntington's disease, we should really be paying attention to um, sleep um, and our sleep structure. I'm going to show you one experiment from mice and one experiment from sheep. And in fact, I'll tell you up, up front that both sheep and mice have circadian rhythm abnormalities and they have abnormal sheep e uh, sleep e.g. but I'll just give you an example from each species. Okay circadian rhythms. Now the great thing about mice is you can pop them in a box and you can measure their activity and without a pointer it's hard to point out to you that the specific things but these experiments are putting mice, this is the trace from a single mouse in a box that is actually double plotted and you can see in the top um, chance you've got wild time mice on the left and R62 mice on the right. These are the Huntington's mice. And they both have a regular rhythm. The, the, in fact, the R62 mouse, this example, happens to have a better rhythm than the wild type mouse. So these mice are completely rhythmic and they have a, a rhythm that of activity because mice are nocturnal, they wake up and they get up and run around um, at, at night. Now look down below another few weeks and you can see that the wild type mice still have a nice regular rhythm but the R62 mice don't actually have a good rhythm anymore and this coincides so R62 mice are a really interesting 
model, mouse model of Huntington's that have um, profound cognitive deficits as well as apathetic behavior. So these mice lose the structure to their day. It's not just that they can't see because they're endogenous rhythm. If you put them completely in the dark, a normal mouse, the wild type mouse on the left-hand side, the, from day six to day 12, it was in complete darkness. So this is his molecular clock driving the rhythm. But the R62 mice have no biological rhythm. And this correlates with their cognitive deficit. So bad news for R62 mice, they don't have a rhythm and they don't sleep properly. But it's actually not all bad news because we did an experiment where we gave the mice a drug to put them to sleep. So we actually increased the amount of, we artificially gave them a sleep-wake cycle and we gave them another drug, modafinil, to wake them up. So what we did is effectively, we blanked out a bit of their sleep artificially with their drug and we increased their activity. So they had a restoration of their sleep-wake cycle. And I'm just going to show you some data. This is data actually measuring a, for a measure of apathy. And you can see that the number of mice who are active, which is the, basically the non-apathetic mice, even with just with alprazolam, which actually put them to sleep, they had a, a few hours extra sleep a night. And that meant that they were much more active. So their apathy was decreased. With modafinil, which actually perked them up in the morning, this had a really remarkable effect on apathy in, in these mice. So it pretty much reversed it. And the combination was better. And I don't have time to show you all of the data, but basically just by giving the drugs that would restore the sleep-wake cycle, improved cognitive function and reversed apathy in this mouse model of disease. Now, I thought this was really fascinating because this is actually quite a severe model. And so it suggests that, you know, if you can improve the sleep-wake cycle, that that improves cognitive function, then it suggests that some of the cognitive deficits in the mice are caused by the poor sleep. Obviously, if you cause poor sleep and then you stop causing the poor sleep and you reverse something, it's, it's actually quite com compelling evidence that sleep deficits might contribute to cognitive decline. Now, if the same is true with people, then actually improving sleep-wake rhythms might improve cognitive and, uh, impairment and apathy in people who have those problems in Huntington's disease. It's not going to do anything to the basic mechanism of those cognitive deficits, but it may improve the additional effect of sleep-wake deprivation. Okay, so the second lot of experiments I want to talk to you about are from the Huntington's disease sheep. Now, the wonderful thing about HD sheep is that they are big. And so I'm going to show you an experiment where we recorded EEGs from sheep. You can see this is a group of sheep. They've had EEG implants for um, about a year. So they're re relatively content. They're standing in a cage waiting for their experiment to start. And you can see on the one that's facing us that there's a, a black box on the top of her head. Now they're all wear, wearing these Elizabethan collars, not because there's anything wrong with the sheep, but because we didn't want them to nudge each other and bump the um, recording device. Because inside that black cap are electrodes connected to their brains, which are implanted, a bit like deep brain um, implants are for Parkinson's disease. And we could record wirelessly from these sheep over periods of many, many days. And the experiments that we did is we first wanted to look at what kind of sleep deficits these sheep had. Now these sheep are five years old when we did this experiment and they don't actually have any measurable um, uh, deficits that we know of. Apart from metabolic deficits, they have aggregates in their brain. They have a circadian deficit but they don't have any other overt symptoms. And in fact, when we looked at this sleep measure, they didn't have much of a change in their EEG either. So this is a quantification of wakefulness in the sheep and the amount of non-REM sleep. 
And the red line is the transgenic HD sheep and the black line are the normal sheep. And you can see that apart from three hours into night two, these patterns are pretty identical. Now, I'm gonna point something out with that um, point where the normal sheep have actually woken up. So they're uh, very awake in the middle of the night. That happened to be when the night watchman came onto the facility. Now he didn't actually come into their room, but he came in through the gate and the, the normal sheep heard him and they woke up. And so there is an increase in wakefulness and a decrease in non-REM sleep. But otherwise, no pathology. Now, you'd think we'd be a bit disappointed by this, um, which at one level, it is disappointing because these sheep have got very subtle phenotype at the moment. However, the nice thing about these kind of um, electrophysiology experiments you, is that you can actually look at the raw signal and you can look at what's happening underneath the recording that you're doing. And this is called the quantitative EEG. And what you can do is you can look at the raw signal and you can transform it mathematically. So you split it down to its component parts. And all of the component parts that we looked at were different wavelengths of oscillations. And when they add them up together, you get this very high frequency, pretty messy raw EEG signal. But when you separate them out, you can actually see lots of different characteristic wavelengths. And again, I don't have time to talk to you about exactly how to do that, but I just want to point out two of them. Now, delta, the delta um, frequency, that's a very slow waveform and that's dominant. That's a dominant frequency during non-REM sleep. And I just want to show you if you quantify this in color, and this is all of the sheep lumped together so you can see them uh, all the, the strength of these um, frequencies at the same time. Now just look at the top left hand side. This is the delta frequency. And you this is recording across time from hours from sunset. So you can see that two or three hours from sunset, there's a lot of um, delta activity. That's because the sleep the sheep are asleep at that time. Um, down on the bottom right hand corner you've got gamma activity, which is high frequency activity that's typically associated with being awake and there's actually relatively little. So these are the normal sheep. But look at the Huntington's disease sheep. Even though these sheep had the same amount of non-REM sleep and all of these analyses are from only the non-REM periods, the amount of delta they had was way less than the normal sheep. And ditto for the gamma, they had way more gamma than the normal sheep. This is during their non-REM sleep. We can see also see differences in patterns of activity between normal sheep and HD sheep the day after a night of sleep deprivation. So this is a normal sheep sleep. Now, not much delta, lots of gamma because the sheep are actually awake. They didn't really mind having a night of sleep deprivation. Compare that to the Huntington's disease sheep. You don't have to be a sleep scientist to see that the normal sheep and the Huntington's disease sheep are very different. So even though the actual amount of sleep all of these sheep were getting was the same, what was happening to their brains while they were sleeping is very different. Okay, so both mice and HD sheep have disrupted circadian rhythms. What about people with Huntington's disease? And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Diana and she's going to talk to you about whether it matters for people with Huntington's disease. Right. Um, as Dr. Morton gave an amazingly wonderful talk, uh, we just want to know that a good night's sleep is really important for just overall quality of life. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about uh, HD and um, issues with sleep uh, and how this affects patients. So as you, as Dr. Morton elegantly described, sleep is super important in cognitive processing, both in learning, problem solving, uh, in focus and attention. It's also really important in emotional dysregulation. So you can imagine when, as Sarah mentioned, uh, you kind of don't sleep too well. You don't feel quite emotionally as better, to, as easy to regulate your 
your emotions. It's a little, it can be irritable and cranky. Certainly, I can be that way when I don't get enough sleep. You also get a general sense of well being and feeling and feeling of productivity. It's really important, as Dr. Morton mentioned, in motor control. It's also important in our regular body's metabolism. And it's also been shown in other disorders to be super important in the regulation uh, of in the clearance of misfolded proteins. This has been shown in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease where um, sleep is critical to the clearing of these toxic fragments that end up, uh, these proteins that are quite important in the pathological mechanisms of this disease. So sleep disorders are actually really common in Huntington's disease, but they're really not well studied. And part of it, it's complicated. In my clinic, at least you know, probably 60% of people actually have some sort of sleep disturbance or other. Um, but let me just show you uh, an example of why it's so complicated. So here is a, a box of plots of uh, reports, self-reports of people who have sleep disturbances. On the left here are controls. In the pink here are motor pre-symptomatic individuals, um, people who have gotten gene tested but don't have any bona fide motor symptoms. And then we have early symptoms patients. And if you look overall at this pattern, you don't really see any kind of pattern. There are sleep disturbances that occur in healthy people and in people who are gene positive carriers. As an example of one of the questions we ask is, why do you wake up during the night? And these are among the most common answers that people give us. They're worried about things. They have to get up to go to the bathroom. And then this happens as people get older. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variability here, but overall you don't see any major differences uh, across them with the exception maybe a little bit here in the pre-symptomatic reporting, having to go to the bathroom. Snoring, again, we see a slight bump in people who are reporting who are pre-symptomatic, uh, pre-manifest, but we don't really see any kind of pattern and then sweating. So sleep questionnaires, are that's part of the problem, are not really specific to symptoms of Huntington's disease. And sometimes when people answer them, it's possible they're not really either answering the question correctly, or maybe they're just not really aware of some of these issues that are occurring. And it may be that their partners may be a better estimate. So for example, snoring. We may ourselves not be aware that we snore, but certainly our bed partners are very aware of that. Um, in sweating, uh, many of my more advanced patients will actually wet the bed sheets. They don't report that they sweat, but their care, uh, their uh, sleep partners do. And oftentimes uh, it's related to metabolic disturbances, possibly mitochondrial dysfunction, and the possibility of just that they're just hypoglycemic, which we do see uh, sweating with hypoglycemia. So it's a very complicated, and again, we may need to kind of think about uh, setting up uh, new questionnaires and new way of studying uh, sleep. The, as uh, Dr. Martin mentioned, there are many problems uh, that, uh, the, the, that uh, are exacerbated by impairments in sleep. In the short term, people can have difficulty concentrating, could be a decline in mood, impairments in memory, and visible signs of fatigue. In the long term, this could affect performance in the particular slate for those who are working uh, can affect impairment, a judgment, and it can certainly worsen all of the clinical symptoms that we think but in HD, cognition, uh, psychiatric symptoms, even and more. And we don't really know uh, if uh, sleep actually affects the clearance of mutant Huntington protein, but it's certainly, we do know that, that there are neuroinflammatory processes that are exacerbated by sleep deprivation, which could certainly uh, contribute. And certainly whether or not the clearance occurs here is really, it would be an important thing to determine. So things that can make sleep worse in HD are just the same things that Dr. Morton mentioned. Caffeine, too much coffee. So each cup of coffee has about 100 milligrams of caffeine. So if you drink two of those, that's going to keep you up uh, throughout the day for sure and possibly keep you from getting to sleep. Um, some of those energy drinks that are out there have uh, twice as much caffeine as, as regular coffee. So decaf only is about 10%. Too much alcohol. So while alcohol, some people drink it to relax or feel as though that can just kind of help them mellow out or chill out a bit, um, it actually affects the sleep architecture. And in people who have a subject sleep apnea, it can actually exacerbate um, the uh, sleep deficit. Not enough exercise, the typical couch potato. Um, and so again, this is a lack of exercise so maybe contributing to lack of sleep, but it's also because sitting around also promotes napping. And that napping again may affect one's ability to sleep and, and sleep uh, the, the normal uh, eight hours that Dr. Morton had mentioned is really important. 
too many electronics. So it's not just that the light is keeping people awake, but also that they may be watching things that are overly stimulating. Uh, you're uh, um, working on, um, you know, watching uh, movies that may be very exciting or violent. Make, make you create images that are very disturbing and keep you up at night. Um, it could just be that you're, you know, playing games and it's hard to stop. And so then you're going to get that may affect your sleep wake cycles. Um, and then there may just be too much worry and people worrying about um, HD, worrying about not getting to sleep in the first place, worrying about what they're going to do the next day, or even worrying about what they're going to wear. And all of these things end up getting back. So we drink a little bit more coffee to keep awake. And then the whole cycle is just made much worse. There are, you know, a number of sleep disorders. And as I mentioned, you know, we, we, we assess patients clinically. Um, and so the, one of the first things, obviously, is sleep-wake disorder, which is about a quarter to half of our patients. And these are things like insomnia, having trouble falling asleep. There are either intrusive thoughts or anxiety, as I mentioned, or maybe just too much caffeine. Um, could be excessive daytime sleepiness, the couch potato we just talked about, or just difficulty staying asleep. And that could be just because people are sweating or they're waking up frequently. They may have to urinate during the night. And this is actually quite a common complaint that we don't really understand quite fully. And it could be just with some of the nutrition centers in the brain being affected or just circadian dysfunction. Uh, we have parasomnias, and the prevalence here is about 12 to 26 percent, and this includes REM behavior disturbance, which is basically physically acting out dreams or nightmares. Uh, REM uh, behavioral disturbance is not something that my patients typically complain about, uh, but it's, it's quite interesting because there are reports, this is from a Shenadol, and a recent uh, review article that came out about sleep disturbances and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and this is a, a very interesting uh, disturbance that actually occurs 10 or 15 years prior to the onset of symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So this is something we probably should be asking a little bit more about in our patients. And then there's sleep disorders breathing, which actually affects the quality of sleep. And this could be obstructive sleep apnea, which occurs in about 31%. And this is where there's a physical block in the airway that's preventing from uh, adequate air exchange. There's central sleep apnea, where the brain doesn't really fully communicate well with muscles of respiration, and then restless leg syndrome, which affects about 15% of patients. And this is interesting because um, chorea actually goes away at night. So the movements that people have where they're tossing and turning in bed, getting tangled in the, in the um, sheets or kicking their partners is really more related to restless legs, or it could be that they just haven't fallen asleep and the chorea is still a present. So sometimes medications can help, and you've heard a lot about melatonin. Melatonin is, uh, uh, there are abnormalities of melatonin metabolism in HD, um, and uh, using that uh, can oftentimes increase the sleep efficiency. Sometimes low-dose anxiolytics, when you're really anxious, um, these anti-anxiety medications can help people calm their thoughts. Um, but however, they have to be used them with caution. They can be addictive. And over time, people become adapted to these medications. And so higher doses may be required. They may also potentially adverse memory or can cause daytime sleepiness. So that could make things worse. Something to look out for. Could be antidepressants. They could be used because we know that depression itself uh, can affect uh, sleep, sleep quality, sleep initiation, and sleep. Uh, maintenance. Um, and so there could be uh, other, uh, um, these medications can help with sleep. And some of the medications are used as antidepressants also have anti-anxiety benefits. We oftentimes will use antipsychotics, which are antagonists. They can come help both work as a sedative in some ways and can help also calm thoughts, some of those disturbing or perseverative thoughts uh, that some patients uh, and some people with HD uh, experience. And then what's interesting for restless lake, we actually are using dopamine agonists, which on the surface doesn't quite make sense, uh, but sometimes at low doses, they can be quite helpful for people who have restless legs um, uh, uh, as well. So sleep studies are a super important thing to consider, especially if um, there um, some of these other uh, uh, more conservative approaches don't work. And this is just a complicated figure showing somebody who's got a complicated set of of, a stimuli, of uh, sensors. So there's a sensors that uh, record brain activity. There's a nasal cannula that monitors airflow. 
there are sensors that monitor the breathing and how much oxygen is getting into throughout the system, uh, monitors uh, for muscle movements, EKG machines. And you can see here, you can see the EEG brain waves uh, that are similar to the patterns that Dr. Um, Morton showed you, eye movements here, airflow, um, and blood oxygenation and heart rhythm levels. And when someone has obstructive sleep apnea, um, they measure an apnea, an apnea hypopnea index, which really is just giving people the number of times a person stops breathing or breathes very shallowly for 10 or more seconds. And this is divided by the number of sleep hours to come up with an index. Um, and sometimes when there's an index is right high, suggesting obstructive sleep apnea, there can be a divided sleep study done the same night where people can try masks to see what might improve the oxygenation level. I would just submit that um, I typically recommend going to a formal sleep study because the home studies are sometimes not as informative. Um, and again, insurance may not pay for a repeat study uh, if a study is not uh, conclusive. The treatment for sleep apnea is um, pretty uh, straightforward. You can use a CPAP machine with a mask uh, that will deliver a constant level of oxygen to the airways during sleep or a BiPAP, which will give you higher pressures. Um, it's really, we've come a long way. A lot of people couldn't tolerate the mask, but now there are more than 100 different types of masks that are available that can be tried. And this can be really critical, as, as Dr. Morton mentioned. Um, having low oxygen is actually good, not good for the heart or the brain, and certainly not for cognitive processing. So just giving the brain enough oxygen can be make a huge difference and make people feel a lot more energetic, less uh, uh, um, apathetic, and overall have a better sense of well-being. Um, and most of these machines, if adequate, if done, if if, if needed, uh, are prescribed, are covered uh, by insurance. In cases where people cannot tolerate a CPAP mask, there are some newer devices that have come on the, on the market the last five years. And one of these is called an Inspire device, which is basically um, a hypoglossal nerve simulator. What it does is just basically provides inputs to the tongue and moves it out of the way. I have to tell you though, you have to use, these are still being um, improved. Uh, the failure rate uh, malfunction rate is rather high um, and people either don't tolerate some of the side effects which includes some funny sensations in the tongue as well as worsening of swallow and sometimes people swallow air and these things can be rather uncomfortable. So that's just a whirlwind tour of some of my own clinical experience uh, taking care of people with uh, Huntington's disease. And the bottom is sleep is a really big deal in HD, and, but we really need to do a lot more to understand sleep disorders, how they affect people, how they affect the pathology, and all of these other things. But as I said, it's complicated. Nevertheless, there are some practical things that you can do. So we're going to have a fireside chat, a session, a Q&A session with Dr. Morton before we open this up uh, for questions. Okay, so is Dr. Morton up? Great. Hi, I'm back. Thank you. Hi, Thank Dr. You. Martin. That's fantastic. So, Dr. Martin, how do you know when you're actually getting enough sleep? Uh, well, that is a good question. So, there. This is the defined. Um, you're getting enough sleep for normal people, and you know, hunting people with Huntington's are normal people underneath with you know a disease on top. So, if you're getting seven or eight hours sleep a night, and you fall asleep easily, you stay asleep well, and you're not using sleep medication, and you feel rested, then you're getting enough sleep. If you're not, Oops. then it's, you know, not necessarily a problem, but it's something that you, you know, this is a good way of a marker for, for whether you're optimally sleeping or not. Great. So what can you do to improve your sleep if your sleep is not quite right? Okay, well, that's easy. There are lots of things we can all do. And I have to tell you, since I started studying sleep, my sleep has improved massively because I, I obey the, many of these rules now. Getting up in the morning at a regular time is really ideal. Getting 30 minutes of light early in the day to switch off your melatonin is also very good for you. Exercise, a bit of exercise. Stopping drinking caffeine after about two o'clock in the afternoon and not eating a heavy meal to burden your um, your tummy and your metabolism just before you go to bed. So have a meal three or four hours before you go to bed, not just before it. And then limit your screen time. Plan ahead. So plan to get seven hours sleep. If you go to bed at, at midnight and you have to get up at six, you haven't planned for seven hours sleep. 
avoiding alcohol. So don't have a nightcap. Have your wine before you, or at least an hour before you go to bed. And really importantly is to sleep cool. Your, your optimal temperature for your bedroom should be about 65 degrees and it should be really dark. I know night lights, no light coming in from outside, ideally no clock radios, and it should be quiet. Now, you can't always control these things, but wherever you can, you should try to control them. And it should be comfy. Your bed should be the place you want to be in most between you know the time you go to bed and the time you get up. And the other thing you should do is tidy it so that you you don't actually spend time thinking about and worrying about what you've left out. And in and once you're in bed, no screens. So don't watch movies in bed. Don't use your phone in bed. Put your phone in another room so you're not tempted. And the other thing is don't worry about not sleeping. So remember, sleep is about resting your body as well as your mind. And if you really can't sleep, you just need to lie there and focus on the fact that you will get some rest if you if you don't actually go to sleep. If you're in bed resting, that that is much better than being up or worrying and wor wandering around. So there are things you can go get up, read, light with a with a non blue light, listen to quiet music, listen to the radio or an audio book, and after twenty minutes, go back to bed. But don't lie in bed worrying about not sleeping is, is actually really important. Yeah. And so what are the benefits of calling a good night in bed? Well, well, in my opinion, there is absolutely, this is one thing you can do that has absolutely no side effects. Nobody has ever suffered from a good night's sleep. And it's cheap. You know, you can change your, um, your sleep patterns without it costing you anything. You know, at the very worst, your body gets the rest and your family or your carer get a good night's sleep if you're not um, disturbed. And at the very best, it might help improving your circadian rhythms, improving your rest. Your brain will get some sleep if you're in bed lying down. People often go to sleep and they say, oh, I've had a terrible night's sleep. But when you look at their EEG, in fact, they've been asleep for, for several hours. And ideally not knock on effects of sleep disruption will be reduced so there are no bad side effects of taking care of your sleep and that means no more counting sheep well only if they send you to sleep <laughs> so i think we'd like to open it up for questions that was excellent thank you both so much for sharing your work with us and i love that you gave us actionable things we can do tonight uh, to all improve our sleep <laughs> So um, anyone who has questions, you can submit them in the Q&A box. Uh, feel free to keep submitting those questions as we continue with the Q&A session. We'll get to as many as we can. And again, they can be technical about research work or non-technical, any questions you might have. Uh, so it looks like we have one question so far. This looks to be for Jenny from an anonymous attendee. Do you only measure wavelengths in the sheep or do they get tasks to perform as well? Okay, so with the sheep experiments, we were we only looked at their brain waves. So we, we just recorded them just doing what they normally did. And these sheep, they were, you know, all sleeping or eating or moving around, but we didn't deliberately give them tasks. The only thing we did is we did give them a sleep deprivation night to see what would happen. So we recorded several nights of them just having normal sleep, but then we looked at what happened with sleep deprivation as well to see whether they responded normally to rebound sleep. I have a, so there's a question from Kim Cagle in the, the chat. Um, and this, I'm super interested in this because I use those sound machines for both my kids and now I use them. They're fantastic, I think. Uh, but she asked, is white noise bad for sleep? White noise isn't bad for sleep if it doesn't disturb your sleep. So if you go to sleep when you've got white noise playing. Pink noise is better than white noise. So white noise is a bit organized, but there are different kinds of noises, but a background noise that allows you to sleep is fine. If you go to sleep, it's fine. It won't um, interrupt, your, interrupt your sleep cycles. If I could interject too on this point, um, there are many patients who develop hyperacusis. 
So they have an acute sense of hearing. Um, and so sometimes other and exterior noises can be very bothersome. Um, and so sometimes I've recommended noise canceling headphones or something like that, earplugs uh, for sleep at night to try to reduce um, external um, uh, input, uh, sensory input, auditory input for patients. So it, it's, uh, and white noise is one of the things that we also recommend. A fan sometimes to keep people cool can also be really helpful. Here's another question maybe for you, Diana, um, from Christopher Cali. Has there been any systematic sleep study with EEG and HD patients or only questionnaires? Um, we've sent some patients in for formal sleep studies. Um, I, you know, I haven't done actinography uh, ourselves, um, but again, most of the time what we're seeing uh, when we send patients is uh, evidence of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and we've had a few patients of central sleep apnea or restless legs. Those are the most common things that we've seen. Uh, people have done the kinds of study that Dr. Morton had described uh, with an extreme length. Um, I did have a question for Dr. Morton, if I could interject, and that was uh, the modafinil. Um, you know, I use that occasionally for patients who have executive dysfunction or tensional issues or even times daytime somnolence. Uh, but one of the things that I have seen is exacerbation of chorea. And sometimes, and then uh, as the medication wears off, that actually uh, exacerbates irritability. wondered if you had seen, I know that the, 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 she don't have the same kinds of things, but I wondered if you had seen some kind of equivalent um, uh, symptoms in your sheep studies. We didn't use them in the sheet. We used modafinil in the mice, and we only used it as a tool for activating the mice. And in fact, the mice don't have very uh, mice don't have chorea. They have some abnormal movements. But of course, one of the things that they that the um, HD mice do is they don't move very much. So they almost, you know, have the opposite to a, a chorea. So they do have abnormal. Um, movements could, that it could be equated to a career. So they have this hind limb grooming, but that wasn't exacerbated with modafinil, but they're mice. And so yeah. they have the career that humans do. And I just like to emphasize that we, we use those drugs basically to impose a sleep wake cycle on the mice, not because we thought the, um, those drugs might help. Although modafinil is used as a cognitive enhancer. So, you know, students use modafinil as a cognitive enhancer. So I, I think it's not been tested properly and I wouldn't just go out and try it without um, my clinician's advice because you just don't know, it, it, the experiments were not done to treat the mice, they were done to, to regulate the sleep and the wake. But that was the point, you know, that if you do regulate your sleep and wake, it does improve your cognitive functions. So better drugs that would be more suited to HD, um, people with Huntington's disease, would be, would be really worth looking for. So drugs that help Huntington's patients sleep and drugs that help people, Huntington patients be more active, I think would be very good. We have more questions, Jenny, about your sleep or your sheep, sorry. Uh, so this is from Yu Queen Peng. In HD sheep, are there any changes in REM sleep? And then there's another question related to your sheep, but maybe I'll let you answer that first. Yes, there were changes in REM sleep. There was um, less REM sleep, but these sheep didn't have very much REM sleep compared to humans. They didn't actually have much REM sleep. And I think it's partly because of the way they were kept that they actually had pretty boring lives. And so they they didn't do very much. They lived in a pen with their friends. Nothing very exciting happened. And REM sleep is you know, very important for emotional processing and for some cognitive function. So if you're not doing very much, you probably don't have as much REM sleep as you, um, as they certainly don't have as much REM sleep as humans. But there was a, a, a decrease in the amount, the amount of REM sleep in the sheep. Interesting. So this is, uh, I think, perhaps related to that point, because you talked about the different alpha and gamma waves. Um, so this is from Naomi Hartop. Thank you for excellent talks. What do you, what do the different waves, alpha, delta, etc., in the sleep EEG correlate to biologically? And could you comment on whether what the underlying HD biology you think is related to disrupted sleep? So perhaps I could go to both of you. Well, I can tell you that it's so, so you have to remember that in all of these um, wavelengths happen in 
stages. So in non-REM sleep, you get all of these waveforms. So all of the, um, the uh, waveforms I show you were during non-REM sleep. It's just that some waveforms are more dominant. So delta waveforms are dominant during sleep and non-REM sleep in particular. Gamma waveforms are dominant when you're actively thinking about things. And so they're very dominant during the daytime and also during REM sleep. And in fact, apart from, from the, just from the EEG, you can't tell the difference between an EEG that's from an awake period or from a REM period. So, so you know, gamma is associated with thinking. Theta is associated with relaxation. But I have to say, each one of these things doesn't, it's not associated with one activity. Your brain is doing all of these things. You have, you're generating all of these waveforms all of the time. It's just sometimes there's more of one um, wavelength than another. And so you can't really separate them. We just studied them separately because it's possible. But in fact, when you look at the, just the EEG, it just looks like a big, a big sort of messy, noisy um, waveform. And so it's, it's very hard to s decide exactly what one or other is doing. Where they're generated though, they're all generated differently and controlled differently. And I, I, I think some of it's understood, but most of it isn't. How it relates to Huntington's disease, I don't know. The thalamus generates sleep. You know, we've got all the parts of the brain that are important for Huntington's are important for sleep as well, but that doesn't really give us any information about the underlying biology. We need to learn, we need to study it more. We actually need to understand this better. There's a question from Megan Donaldson to Dr. Roses. Can you talk about the increases in the need for sleep as HD progresses over the years? It seems to me that the more progressed a person is in their disease, the more they sleep. Is this because they require more sleep or that they are spending more time in bed or in a chair and therefore napping more? Oh, that's a really great question. I don't think I know the answer to that. I think we do see that um, the amount of sleep or the amount of time in bed <clears throat> actually increases over the course of at least my clinical experiences. People seem to need more and more time in bed, whether or not that reflects that the sleep is actually even more perturbed. And so the quality of sleep isn't so good. And so that may be reflecting that. Um, the patient's needs are much greater. Uh, and it just may be that they are, you know, aren't able to um, you know, uh, they don't have, they're not enough energetically able to do as much, um, as well. Um, so I think it's, it's a complicated question, but I think it's, you see this in every neurodegenerative disease where people are spending more time in bed over the course of, uh, as a disease progresses. Um, so I think that's a, a $2 million question to study, um, at least. Uh, I think it's a super important and, and it may give us some really important insights. Um, I mean, I think that the other question too is, you know, we've seen, I've seen a very advanced patients who don't really sleep. They have their eyes open and they're just not moving. And so the question is, you know, we haven't studied those people by EEG to actually know what the brain is doing at that point. So there's a few questions related to what people can take. Um, so Herwig Lang asks, medication to help with sleep issues, question mark. And then Charlie Smith said, is taking CBD a good way to promote sleep? Yeah, so C I'll start with the CBD. Um, I, a number of patients that I see do, do take it. It helps them relax. So when they have insomnia or a lot of anxiety, it seems to help kind of calm them down. And that seems to be very helpful. I'll defer to Dr. Morton or to Jenny about whether or not it, how it might affect sleep architecture. But I do know that for relaxation purposes, it does help a number of patients. And some people will tell you that it helps with movements because uh, sometimes people are become more aware of movements. The chorea seems to be more prominent when people are tired. And so that makes them even more anxious when they hadn't seen the chorea now they're seeing it lying down. So for those kinds of reasons, I think CBD, and, and as you know, there are cannabinoid receptor abnormalities in HD. So, um, you know, there's a, a complicated pathway there. Um, in terms of what people take, um, you know, we don't, the, the typical sleepers, the Ambien, um, I don't typically use, they're not very helpful in my patients with HD. 
I think most of my colleagues and I will use neuroleptics because if there's a comorbid psychiatric symptoms or obsessiveness or perseveration or any of those other things, this, the, uh, the neuroleptics can be quite helpful for that uh, because it'll help with the OCD and the perseveration. Um, sometimes we'll use trazodone. It's an old fashioned antidepressant and has a great sleeper. It, it helps patients quite a bit without a lot of the uh, side effects. For some people, again, when they have a lot of anxiety, you can use low dose clonazepam and for restless legs. Um, you, you know, I use, I was quite nervous. I think there was a question there about the use of, of dopaminergic agonists in someone with HD, worrying that that would either make psychiatric symptoms worse or the obsessiveness worse, um, the sort of the impulsivity, excuse me, worse, um, or um, would make the movements worse. And at low doses, it, it, it seems to be very helpful with the sleep, uh, but not um, affect the other system. So I think that's getting back to the original idea that this is very complicated and it's not a one-stop shopping for uh, for anyone, either you know, partly, you know, everyone's different, but also over the course of the disease, you may need different interventions. Maybe we can wrap it up with one more question. Uh, I think we could give this one to Jenny uh, from Adele Booty. Great presentation, thank you. Does sleep improvement in HD mice extend their lifespan? That's a really good question. No, they still died of the disease um, at, at the same time, but they, you know, the behavior before then was, was very similar. So whatever's killing the mice, and remember these mice die very young, you know, so they, they actually die before they get neurodegenerative changes in the brain and they, so they have peripheral effects. And so the, the sleep didn't, um, promote their survival, but nothing really promotes the survival of these, this particular line of mice. So if we use the less, um, I, you know, I, I doubt that it would promote the survival because I think the mechanisms controlling whatever killed the mice are very different from cognitive decline. So, um, so I think that it was a good effect on cognition, but no effect on survival. I think it's interesting though, because you both mentioned sleep apnea and we heard a talk earlier in the year from some HDF funded fellows that they're studying heart issues and cardiac issues tend to be one of the leading causes of death in HD. And so perhaps it might not work in mice, right? But if we can understand more about sleep issues and solve some of these things, maybe it will have a benefit on the cardiac issues and that could improve overall survival. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think, I think this is, this is where the limitations of mouse models that are severe, you can, you can get really good pointers as to what we should think about in humans, but they, they are mice and even the sheep stuff, you know, they're still sheep. They're not, they're not human beings and they have different, different lives and uh, different things that, that ultimately uh, matter in terms of their disease. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. We were at the end of our time, so I think we'll wrap it up there. If you had a question that we didn't get to, I will send those to our speakers. And if they're willing, um, they can follow up with you directly. I want to end by, again, thanking our sponsor for the webinar, Neurochrome Biosciences, as well as everyone who has donated to the HDF. Your money is being used to support research for HD. And of course, our audience. And last, but absolutely not least, our speakers, Dr. Jenny Morton and Dr. Diana Rosas, thank you both so much for the fantastic talks. Um, registration is now open for our June Research Spotlight webinar titled Shedding Light on Huntington's Disease, Insights from Three Young Investigators. We will be joined by Drs. Isabella Pena, Terence Gall-Duncan, and Vafsa Magadi to hear about their HDF-funded postdoctoral projects. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Bye.